Welcome to the Fundamentals of Ultrasound Physics Lecture Series, brought to you by the Honors Ultrasound Group of the Ohio State University of Medicine. The lecture for today is on image artifacts as seen in a clinical ultrasound. What is an artifact? An artifact is a false image in which echoes without anatomic correlate are observed. They do not have one-to-one -one correspondence with regards to location, interface, and intensity. Artifacts could be due to many things. It could be technological limitation of the system, operator error, or violation of assumptions. Artifacts could lead to misdiagnosis and overcalls. What we want to do in this lecture is to describe in detail the origins of artifacts and discuss the technology that is used to fix them. Let's go through some of the assumptions of ultrasound scanning. Number one, we assume that beam dimensions are infinitesimal, that is, the x, y, and z directions can be resolved down to very minute dimensions. Two, ultrasound image only comes from the transmit line of sight only. Three, speed of sound is constant. Four, the amplitude of echo is determined solely by the reflective and intrinsic property of the reflector and nothing else. Finally, the all detected echoes originate from the main beam. As you know, a lot of these are untrue. Recall in the transducers lecture that beam dimension in the axial, which is parallel to beam direction, and the perpendicular direction or lateral resolution can affect resolution of the ultrasound image in this two-dimensional beam. There is a out of image dimension called slice thickness, which is perpendicular to the image plane, which can also affect the ultrasound resolution. The further you are from the transducer surface, and especially beyond the focal zone, you can see that the thickness of this Z plane or slice thickness direction is significant. This partial volume effect, which you see also in CT scanning, can creep up to the two-dimensional image that we discussed in the previous slide and thus affect the resolution by introducing artifacts that are not real. The next assumption that we want to discuss is line of sight transmission. When a transmitter, such as this transducer, emits the ultrasound beams towards the reflectors of interest, you expect that the echoes return along the same beam direction as follows. However, in clinical and actual cases, this is not always true. We'll discuss in the next uh, couple of slides uh, of this lecture that a lot of times images come back from outside the line of sight. The next assumption that is often assumed during ultrasound scanning is that the speed of sound, in this case of ultrasound, is constant. That is very far from the truth. You learn that in soft tissue, the sound of uh, Velocity is 1540 meters per second. However, you probably remember that in fat, it's slightly slower. The velocity is 1450 meters per second. And in fluid, which appears anechoic in ultrasound, the velocity is about 1500 meters per second. The differences in the speed in the different media will cause refraction of the ultrasound beam, which will, by virtue of the bending of the beam, cause the images to be located in places that you did not expect. Furthermore, with regards to this specific assumption of the constant sound speed, we will know that refraction is described by Snell's Law, which we covered back in the uh, earlier lectures. And specifically, refraction leads to three groups of errors, or artifacts. First one is misregistration. The second one is edge shadowing, otherwise known as defocusing of the ultrasound beam. And lastly, refraction can cause ghosting, which is the doubling uh, of the image. The next assumption that uh, is very commonly assumed is that the echo amplitude that you see returning to the transducer upon scattering from the, uh, the reflectors is solely due to the, in the intrinsic reflectivity property 
of the material. However, you will learn in this lecture that that is not solely the case. A lot of times the echo amplitudes are modulated depending on the angle of insonation of the ultrasound probe relative to the uh, structure. It is changed by frequency, uh, as seen by acoustic scatterers, and the interface, either the material on either side of the particular interface, uh, would have a say in terms of the difference. And then finally, the assumption that all detected echoes come from the main ultrasound beam is sometimes erroneous. Many times, even in uh, today's ultrasound probes, where uh, mainly arrayed probes are used, you will still see psi lobes and grating lobes interacting, particularly with strong reflectors within the, um, uh, the body that will generate lateral artifacts. In other words, what you're actually seeing in the sound beam in the, the main part of the image will be cluttered with artifacts from adjacent structures that sometimes might not be even it be from the plane of interest. And specifically, slice thickness and refraction can cause a lot of these specific image artifacts. Before we delve into the subject of ultrasound artifacts, there are a few more definitions that we need to tuck in. First one is echogenicity, and then next we're going to talk about briefly about specular reflectors, and finally we're going to talk about acoustic scattering, otherwise known as speckle. But first let's talk about echogenicity. What is the definition? Echogenicity, in short, is the propensity to reflect ultrasound waves. The more echogenic a structure is, the stronger will be the returning echo. Practically speaking, the image will appear white or slightly uh, lighter gray, a shade of gray. When a structure is a term hyperechoic, it means that the echo has higher amplitude relative to the surrounding structures. The appearance will be white. And examples uh, that we're talking about that are hyperechoic structures are a diaphragm, pericardium, the pleura, and bones. This next slide is a, an image uh, of an ultrasound uh, scan of a uh, hypodermic needle uh, within the surface uh, of a patient's uh, forearm. You can see here that there is a long linear structure with a uh, hyperechoic uh, uh, nature to it. Uh, compared to surrounding structures, the return echo amplitude definitely is greater than the surrounding soft tissue. As we point an arrow towards this uh, hypodermic needle, you see that it uh, is a very uh, useful uh, property of the metal because uh, it's something that stands out within the ultrasound image. There are two more uh, variations of echogenicity that I want to talk about. The next uh, variation is hypoechoic uh, intensity. This describes an echo of lower amplitude compared to the surrounding structures. It has a gray appearance. Typically, it describes soft tissues. Examples include kidneys, spleen, uterus, thrombus. And anechoic structures basically have minimal to, to nil echo amplitude, has a black appearance, describes unclotted blood, bile, urine, ascites, and pleural effusions. This next structure is an image of a patient's uh, carotid region. On top uh, the vessel is the uh, internal uh, is the uh, internal uh, juggler vein on top of the uh, carotid artery. Uh, within the uh, the vein, the venous structure, you see there is a uh, hypochoic structure surrounded with uh, anechoic fluid. So specifically, in terms of the hypoechoic structure, or let's start with the anechoic structure, we have blood, which uh, surrounds the hypochoic structure in the middle. So the arrow is pointing to the black region of the uh, the vein. Next, we're going to point out the hypoechoic thrombus, which is the hypo, uh, the kind of the uh, the medium uh, amplitude structure, uh, so residing within the uh, internal jugular vein. 